And uh, yeah, I'm just going to give you a brief uh, run through of the process uh, in relation to the development plan, what it is and the timeline that's involved. Uh, this is the very same presentation that I've opened with last night and the night before. So I recognize a few of the names. Uh, anybody uh, who's been on last night or the night before, apologies. Uh, now might be a good time to go and get a cup of tea. This will take about eight, 10 minutes uh, maximum. Um, so what is a development plan? Well, the development plan is often described as a social contract, a contract between the local authority and the public. Uh, it's adopted by and made by the elected members of each planning authority, and that's very important uh, that, you know, it's the elected representatives, your elected representatives that will make the plan, uh, not the officials at the council. Um, the, the council is obliged to seek the delivery of all of the policies and objectives in its development plan and is bound by its own development plan. And also we test development against it. So uh, if somebody makes a planning application, for instance, uh, what we do in the first instance is we look at our own development plan to see whether or not the proposal is consistent with the policies and objectives of our plan. Uh, the plan will consist of a written document or a series of uh, documents. Uh, in this instance, there are a number of volumes uh, and a series of maps and the maps illustrate the spatial application of those policies. Um, all aspects of development and land use are covered by the development plan and um, as well, I suppose, funding applications uh, where we make applications to the department for funding for certain infrastructural um, provision or for other initiatives that we wish to undertake. Um, you know, the first thing that the, the government or the relevant department will do is they'll look to our, our plan and they'll want to know how that proposal ties in with our broad strategy and, you know, what support there is for the particular proposal that we're bringing forward. Um, as I said, the plan is accompanied by a series of maps. What you see there in front of you is um, the zoning map for Waterford City from the last development plan, the 2013 plan. And that would typically consist of a map that shows a, a color coded fashion, the different land uses that are being uh, facilitated and controlled and managed throughout the city and uh, different colors um, relating to different land uses as you see on the legend on the right hand side. So as I say, the maps illustrate the policy, the, the document gives you a little bit more background and detail as to how that policy might be applied. Uh, our development plan falls into a hierarchy, uh, takes its place amongst the hierarchy of spatial plans, uh, starting with the national, with the national planning framework, uh, which uh, was adopted by government in 2018 and applies to the state as a whole. Uh, below that, then, there are three regions. Uh, the country is divided into three for regional planning purposes. Uh, we find ourselves in the southern region and the southern regional assembly, following on from the adoption of the national planning framework, adopted a regional plan for the southern region, which is the Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy, the RICS. Um, that was adopted and came into effect in 2020. And following on from that now, each local authority has to give effect to national and regional policy and as well, I suppose, bring some local flavour and deal with the local issues that present themselves uh, in their own development plans. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment. We're preparing a plan for Waterford City and County. And below that, again, there's another tier of what we call local area plans. And once we have our county and city development plan in place, we'll look at preparing a suite of local area plans that will deal with um, you know, specific areas. So we're looking at towns like, say, Tremor, Port Law, Dungarvan, um, you know, places like that, that, you know, would have had plans in the past and so we will be revising and updating those plans in light of the, the overall, the overarching policy and county plan. So there's the national planning framework, as I say, which was adopted in May 2018. Uh, the Southern Regional Assembly's Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy, which came into effect in January of 2020. Uh, we're obliged to have regard to both of those and to give effect to those uh, insofar as we can in our local area. Um, what we have at the moment and what we are, as of this evening, still operating are three different development plans across Waterford City and County. Um, Waterford City Council and Waterford County Council were amalgamated and Waterford City and County Council came into being as a single entity on the 1st of June 2014. Uh, so prior to that merger date, uh, there would have been different planning authorities with different development plans. So we've got the Waterford County Development Plan, which was adopted in 2011, the Dungarvan Town Development Plan in 2012, and the Waterford City Development Plan, which was adopted in 2013. 
Uh, now, each one of those would have been due in normal circumstances uh, to have expired by now. Um, but because we were waiting for the national planning framework and the national or the regional spatial and economic strategy to come along, uh, we were asked to pause and to wait uh, so that you know we would have a context uh, within which to review those plans and to stitch them together into a single unified plan. So we're a little bit behind, but that's true, no fault of our own. We were following instructions from government in that regard. And below those three plans, we had local area plans. We still have and we still operate these local area plans. As I said, we've got one for Tremor, one for Lismore, one for Port Law. And again, it would be our intention to revise all of those once we have our city and county development plan in place, the new plan in place. Uh, and we'll also do local area plans for a number of other areas as well. Uh, one area in particular that we're interested in doing a plan for is the Gweltacht area. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an area with its own particular issues that I think, you know, need to be addressed in, in its own plan as opposed to it just being a chapter within the overall city and county plan. So as well as the national and regional planning strategies, there are also a series of guidelines which issue from time to time from the minister and from the department. Uh, they're issued under section 28 of the Planning and Development Act and we're uh, bound to have regard to them. Um, they deal with a whole range of issues such as you know, access to national road networks, um, things like flood risk management, building heights, urban design, and all of these uh, form, again, the background, uh, the suite of documents that we have to look at and the context within which uh, we prepare our own plan for Waterford City and County. Um, so again, just an overview of the development plan, it should provide an overarching strategic vision for the city and county. It's set out integrated policies for an objectives to realize that strategic vision. Uh, it should be consistent, as I said, with national and regional planning policy. It should be evidence-based and be a catalyst for positive change and progress. And in all instances, you know, there's a basic underlying principle that the development plan should ensure protection of the environment and heritage. Um, as I said earlier, the plan is adopted by the members uh, of the um, planning authority, the, the members of the council who adopt it. Um, and the public are invited in uh, on a number of occasions throughout the process. We've already had an issues paper. Um, we're now going through a draft plan and we'll have uh, amendments later on uh, in the process. And at every stage, uh, we have public consultation. We engage with the public. We listen to your views. We take those on board. We bring them back to the council and we change as necessary uh, to reflect the views of the public as um, as considered and um, as uh, adapted, I suppose, uh, by, by the members of the council on your behalf. Um, layout and content, the act is very specific. It's the Planning and Development Act. It sets out, I suppose, the process that we've got to go through and also tells us what specific areas we have to cover in the development plan. Now, obviously we can go beyond these areas, but these are the areas that we have to consider. Things like the zoning of land, climate change, Gwail Tucked areas, natural heritage, archeological heritage, traveler accommodation. These are all things that we have to have regard to and that we have to address in our development plan. As I said, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's certainly something um, these are these are areas that must in every instance be addressed and um, so um, again evidence-based as I said earlier th there's an awful lot of information behind this uh, we've commissioned Aero uh, in their, uh, based in Maynooth University uh, to do statistical and socioeconomic um, demographic analysis on our behalf we look to the CSO to quarterly um, um, output from the CSO in relation to um, income, unemployment, employment, sectoral changes, that type of thing. Uh, we look at travel to work patterns, we look at things like household sales, property price index, all of those you know, will feed into and will inform the plan. As I said, the Act, the Planning and Development Act, uh, sets out the process. Uh, it's very uh, rigid in terms of you know the process that has to be followed. Um, there's not a scope for us to deviate from that, but we're working well. We're working within that process. Uh, we're we're on time and we're moving forward. Uh, step one, we've already completed, which was the publication of a draft strategic issues paper. 
um, that went out on public consultation. Um, we had a very good, very engaging round of public consultation. Um, we took all of the submissions that came in, um, put them together in the chief executive's report to the members. The members then considered those, gave the executive a direction as to what they wanted to see in the plan. And then we worked with the members through a long number of uh, workshops, uh, which spanned a series of months um, working on the draft backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until we got a draft that the members were broadly um, happy with to put on public display, which is the draft that's currently out on display that's up on our website. Um, we're now back uh, to ask you what you think of it. Uh, have we left anything out? Is, are we moving in the right direction? Uh, or are there you know, amendments that should be made? So we'll listen to what you have to say. We'll put all that together into a report, feed that back to the members. Members will consider amendments. And again, if there are amendments to be made, which certainly there will be, um, those will go back on public display again, and we'll have another round of consultation such as this, although hopefully early next year, we might be able to do it face to face rather than online. And then when all that's done, uh, the development plan will be adopted. And the, the timeline for that is 2022. Uh, the plan would run for six years then from 2022 until 2028. Um, so as I said, the draft development plan, it's available to view and download on the council's website. Um, you've probably all been to the website already to register for this evening. Uh, it's consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. Uh, the documents, the maps, all the appendices, all the supporting information is there. Uh, we would invite you all to make submissions, um, formal submissions using the website. Marcus will walk you through that later on, just tell you how you would go about that. But again, you know, this is all about trying to find out and trying to gauge public opinion in relation to what we're trying to do and to bring that public opinion back to the members so that the members can make an informed decision as to what they will include in the plan. Um, so that's more or less where we're at at the moment. As I said, the plan is on display. Um, we're available throughout the public display period, which runs until the end of the month of August. So throughout the months of July and August, we're available to you. Uh, we've put our phone number, our email address, um, all our contact points of contact are there on the website. Uh, we'll be uploading videos. Uh, there are some videos uploaded there already and all of the documentation, including all of the appendices and all the environmental reports are there. But certainly if there's anything that you want to have clarified or anything that you'd like to discuss with us, pick up the phone or send us an email and we'll be straight back to you. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Liam, uh, for that. And again, just reiterate that the closing date for submissions is the 30th of August at 5 p.m. Um, and now we'll hand over to Hugh. And Hugh O'Brien is going to give us an overview of the topics that we're discussing tonight, which is transportation, climate change, infrastructure and regeneration. Hugh, if you'd just like to uh, share your screen there. Uh, sorry, Vanessa, I just have run into a problem with my screen here. <clears throat> It's gone on to the presentation, but it's gone on to Liam's presentation and everything, okay. I have nothing on it. Sorry now, I'll just try and... Uh, um, no I'll tell you, just... maybe... Um, yeah, sorry about this, this is just... Um, I, I may need to log back on and off again because I can't seem to do anything here. And maybe if Marcus does his, um, does his presentation and I log out here and see if I can get this up again. Yes. Yeah. No problem, Thanks, Hugh. Thanks, you. Um, yeah, okay, sorry about that. No problem. Um, I'll just share my screen here, folks. Um, how's it going, everybody? You're very welcome here tonight. Um, oh. Right, I'm just knocking here now. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the consultation portal we've developed um, so people can view the plan and make their submissions. So the address is consult.waterfordcouncil.ie or alternatively you can access the site through our, um, our own web page waterfordcouncil.ie um, so this will once you come into consult.waterford.ie this will land you to our home page um, where you can register as a new user and it will this is where you can register and make your submission also and um, once you click into this page here It'll bring you to, um, sorry, to, onto your new, your new, your kind of our homepage effectively. So this will provide you with the menu of a general overview of the plan. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see all the information in relation to, you know, um, display periods and um, closing dates for submissions. Um, and again, if you scroll down, it gives more information on how to 
um, make a submission, register as a user, and we've attached a little video link here. So there's a seven minute video that will take you through every thing you need to know step by step um, on how to make a submission. So on the right hand side, you'll see um, the plan itself um, in all in downloadable format. Um, it's all kind of broken up into maybe smaller sections that makes, makes it easier to download. But essentially, the plan itself is in four volumes. So you volume one, um, which is in three parts. And these are all the relevant chapters that are set out within that um, volume. Um, in volume two, you have your development management standards, which is essentially the, the rule book, I suppose, with which we would kind of assess planning applications against. Um, volume three shows a list of appendices. But it's quite a long list of appendices there. So any kind of particular one that you're interested in, be it um, you know, be it our place making strategy or a retail strategy, which is kind of I suppose isn't really the topic tonight, but infrastructure capacity, any of these can be all just clicked clicked on and downloaded um, from there. So next, then you have our volume four, which is our maps. Um, I'll come back to that in a second, and then we have our environmental reports, which are also. And they're kind of heavy documents. So we have separated those out from the appendices. Um, so there's a strategic flood risk assessment, um, our SEA, strategic environmental assessment, um, and our appropriate assessment document. So as I had said here, like say, for example, if you had a particular interest in say chapter five, as he was going to illustrate now tonight, he's going to talk maybe chapter five, six, um, chapter nine climate action so if you want to read more on chapter five then you just click this link here now i just have a tab open already that i use um just to avoid any gremlins that might pop up um so that would give you a quick overview of the chapter itself and then you can continue reading and download the chapter as necessary again um say if there's any of the particular appendices you were looking at so say if it was um you know, as I said, maybe a placemaking strategy. So you have Appendix 5 there, placemaking strategy. You click on that, and that will then give you the same thing. It sets out a placemaking strategy. Um, and then you just download, um, you save it to your computer, print it off, um, or just, you know, read it on screen. So now I'll just skip back to our maps, which is Volume 4. So these, um, I suppose, are our story maps, which are developed to illustrate um, you know, all the various elements of the plan. So we have um, six, I suppose, books of maps. And within each of those, there are different tabs of maps. Um, so, you know, it ranges from our core strategy map to our settlement and zoning map. Um, so I might just flick into, we say, our settlement and zoning map here and just briefly take it through that. Uh, I suppose, again, anybody that might have tuned in the last couple of nights, they might, this might be a little bit repetitive, but... Um, Again, it's worth maybe just taking you through this. So this will say would give you an overview of our zoning mapping for the county. Um, and you can click into your relevant area and find out what particular site you're looking at, maybe. Um, and it'll give you the so it'll give you your, your legend here as well, which I can't seem to get it. Now I'll have to pull this out of the way. Yeah, so we have a little legend here as well, which will give you the GZT for whatever the particular site is. Um, so I'll put this out of the way. So again, as you scroll scroll down along, um, this will overlink with our flood zone mapping also will come in. Um, so like the, the any of these can be zoomed in and clicked in upon any particular site. So it's all very interactive and very user friendly. Again, if you have any issues on this, um, you can contact us directly in the planning section, and we'll you know talk you through it over the phone or whatever. But it is you know it, it's 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 a good a good product and fairly user friendly. So again, there's development objectives um, here or you know, what whatever your particular interest is in, we'd kind of encourage you to maybe, you know, have a dig around, be it settlement hierarchy, boundaries and functions. They're all little shortcuts that you can just click, click into as well. Um, so again, we'd say if your interest was uh, from talking tonight with you, um, if it was your transportation map. So this map would contain four maps um, transport objectives, recreational routes, um, and then are overlaid with land use zoning. There's airport mapping. So again, you can see, you know, this is for the city and, um, you know, transport objectives for the city, the east of the county. So you can click in and out and see what's there, um, see how it relates to your area. Um, again, there's recreational routes that you can see. So it's all very, 
you know, it's overlaid and so they're, you know, easily located and easy to find. And again, we've all overlaid this with your zoning. So there's a little bit of, I suppose, maybe fiddling around with it to, to kind of get, get used to it, but it's um you know, it should be it should be no problem, we hope. Then there's your water for the airport mapping again, if you if you've interest in that. So again, I suppose what we what we'd say to people is um, you know, to once they come into the portal to register um and to make a submission. It's very important for us that we get um, I suppose as many submissions as possible because what it means is that we can quantify the public's interest in a particular area and we can feed that through then to chief executive support, which is ultimately um you know adopted by the members. So it becomes effectively your plan. So once you have you know your 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 speak in, you know, we have to provide a you know a summary and a commentary on that. And hopefully, you know, it will find its way through a specific objective or you know something for your area. Um, and again, we, we we do take submissions in um, you know in the old format in in a letter or whatever. But maybe if you use the portal, it enables us to maybe group the submissions a bit better and tag them. And you know, we can you know run all sorts of kind of reports and then you know and shortcuts and. Um, you know, see how many people wanted to speak about transport in the city, for, say, for example. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Um, as Vanessa had said earlier on, the closing date is the 30th of August. Um, so we would encourage you to have a have a, have a dig around and, you know, um, send us in your submission. Um, so that's that's about it. I'll, I'll hand back to um, to Vanessa now. Um, hopefully Hugh is back online. Hugh, are you okay? Great, thanks um, for that, Marcus. And just maybe while Hugh is getting ready there to share his screen, just a couple of questions have come in there. So thanks very much. Everyone's posted already their questions. Um, Marcus asks, there's, or sorry, Alan asks about the seven submissions, if they're accessible. Um, and yes, they are. So Marcus, you might just get back quickly on that question. And just one on the videos, they will be posted as Liam has indicated, um, as well as the discussion. So at any point, if anybody would like any of their contribution this evening in the discussion to be redacted, just let any of the planning team know um, and that part will be taken out and the rest of the video will be posted. So the aim is to make sure everyone um, in the community can just catch up on those conversations. And finally, just on James's question regarding, do you need to re-register in the portal? And if you've already registered once you don't need to, you can just log back in or do forgot password if you need to reset. Okay, so um, I hope those answers those. And just uh, Hugh, I hope that you're ready now, which seems to be, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Vanessa. And apologies again for my my uh, uh, my glitch. Um, hopefully that's the only one of the night. Um, so hopefully you can all see that uh, in presentation mode. So. Um, again, just uh, filling in, I suppose, uh, slotting in from behind uh, Liam's presentation, um, just looking uh, a little bit at, at um, the, uh, the, the, the structure of the plan, maybe, and just where, where, the where you'll find the relevant um, policies and what the general policy <coughs> um, uh, thrust is uh, for, for the topics uh, transport, climate change, utilities and regeneration. Um, so. <clears throat> really just a, by way of an overview of the presentation so we'll, we'll, we'll look at the the, the the those main pieces i suppose um uh transport mobility um if you're, if you're looking through the the document uh, online um uh, that's chapter five climate action is is included with biodiversity and environment uh in chapter or sorry the first one is chapter five uh chapter nine looks at climate action biodiversity and environment um I think it's 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 uh, it must be stressed, I suppose, um, uh, and and it'll be apparent, I suppose, when I go through the slides further on, that climate action isn't doesn't sit neatly into one spot. Um, it underpins everything, I think, in the plan. So it's it's not something we can we can sort of um, I suppose put neatly into a corner and say that's climate change now and, and uh, move happily along. I think it's something that that is is intrinsically um, uh, you know incorporated with all the policies. Um, chapter six, uh, utilities uh, infrastructure, um, uh, that also includes uh, energy and communication, but we'll look at the utilities and infrastructure tonight. Um, so, and uh, regeneration is a little bit like the um, climate action. Um, it's a, it, it sort of transcends a number of chapters, but and mainly I think chapter uh, uh, chapter three, seven, eight, and 11, um, uh, and indeed chapter two, uh, dealing with the core strategy, chapter three would be 
in relation to the city and the mass seven and eight would be around housing and placemaking and, and chapter 11 is, is our heritage so um uh, that's uh that, that that's where you'll find i suppose uh, uh most of what I, i'll be uh just highlighting tonight um in terms of transport and mobility again um we have uh, each of the chapters it sort of looks at um or identifies strategic objectives and and in some instances strategic policies um uh so uh, i think in terms of transport and mobility um uh, what underpins our all our policies uh, is is the uh, aim to achieve a sustainable integrated low carbon transport system with excellent connectivity within and to waterford um waterford city waterford county uh, to make efficient use of transport networks existing uh, uh, and ensure that uh, all new developments contribute towards reducing the need to travel long distances and encourage people to walk cycle or use public transport um provide public and uh, public and active transport infrastructure and services to meet the needs of neighborhoods our towns our villages and our rural areas uh, and uh, a, a really uh, underpinning the the concept of that 10 minute city or, or town concept um in terms of the strategic policy um i suppose falling from those big larger uh, uh, aims um uh, we're, we're looking at uh, trying to ma mainstream the, the principle of integrated um sustainable transport systems um with a significant shift towards public transport, walking and cycling, prioritizing active and sustainable transport and reducing car dependency across the city and county, uh, integrate land use and transport planning aligned with the delivery of infrastructure um, to uh, achieve the concentric city, higher density uh, infrastructure development in strategic locations um, and promote a modal shift away from private car usage by supporting <clears throat> um, improved facilities, et cetera, as, as, um, uh, as I've stated already. Um, the key policy folks, I think, in, in terms of transport and mobility, <clears throat> um, I, I've tried to summarize them here, but um, there are a significant number of policies. So uh, if you need to maybe delve in a little deeper into them, um, I suggest uh, you know, uh, looking in more detail at, at those and specifically. Um, but the key, the key focus, I suppose, is, is to devise and deliver um, the Waterford Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy in, in association with um, the, the National Transport Authority and indeed uh, Kilkenny County Council. Um, uh, it's very uh, that will be a significant piece of uh, uh, of study um, that hasn't been undertaken previously, and we're one of the last of the regional cities to to have that completed at a national level. So we would hope. I think um, uh, our our intention is that that we our our our, our information, I suppose, is that uh, the NTA will have will have a, a significant body of work done on that, and and hopefully we'll have a draft. Um, ready, ready for uh, towards the latter end, quarter three or four of this year. Um, so our intention will be to to incorporate um, a little bit more detail around the the uh, I suppose the mechanics of of what the WMS will 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 provide in terms of land use and transport planning. Um, also, local transport plans, um, LTPs for our larger towns in particular, um, uh, and uh, a review of the plots on foot of uh, that. The, sorry, the the water planning, land use, and transport transportation strategy, um, which is 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 uh, is is um, I suppose it's it's old, um, uh, but it's I think it's timely that we 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 look at it um, in terms of. Um, the, the objectives of the national planning framework um, and the WMATS uh, re results as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, the policy W City 26 and other RSCS that the regional spatial economic strategy derived issues to support the concentric city model that they're they're in there as well. Um, supporting active travel through cycle paths uh, or sorry cycle plans, um, priority routes, networks, and improved facilities and interconnectivity. Uh, and possibly park and ride. Uh, again, a lot of these uh, for Waterford City in particular will 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 come from uh, will, will be uh, maybe highlighted in in uh, the, the the metropolitan area transport strategy. So we have to wait and see what that what what that uh, uh, gives us. Um, support for public modes which are uh, universally accessible. Um, support for strategic transport infrastructure such as ports, airports, harbours, piers, and access thereto. Uh, rail and the road network, including uh, indicative, we've also included ind indicative route uh, corridors for uh, an identification of strategic regional roads, um, uh, uh, and they're uh, uh, set out in some of the the, the mapping that Marcus has, has spoken about. Um, continued improvements uh, of road and street networks and traffic safety and, and calming measures to support active modes. Um, uh, uh, managing uh, access uh, to and from national roads and land uses uh, adjacent. 
um, and uh, general, I suppose, development management um, issues, looking at mobility management planning uh, and uh, sort of standards around uh, uh, car and, and bicycle parking. Um, uh, there are also, uh, in addition, I suppose, to what's included in, 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 in the chapter, in volume one, um, there, there uh, in volume two, which is is the uh, development management standards. There's a, a significant amount of detail in there, uh, specifically in relation to car parking standards and, and the cycle parking. Um, in terms of climate action, um, I suppose the, again the strategic objective um, uh, set out in chapter nine is to integrate climate change and adaptation considerations into land use policy objectives and decision making processes to enhance uh, our resilience uh, to the effects of climate change and reducing our carbon footprint. So. Again, a fairly high level objective, which which we uh, which we have tried to, uh, uh, I suppose, incorporate into into the policies. Um, the key policy focus, um, I suppose, again, uh, looking at, 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 at what the, the overarching sort of policies are, um, uh, the core strategy, I think, is, is very important uh, in Chapter two um, and the understanding of the, I suppose, the what underpins that. Um, and uh, part of that, I suppose, is set out in, in legislation in, in Section 10N of the Planning and Development Act 2000 as amended. Um, and that's really the, the, the requirement to align land use and transportation um, and, and structure a reduction uh, in energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions and address the necessity of adaptation to climate change, having regard to the location, layout and design of development. Um, that's a significant statement. Um, I think, and it's something that we we've tried to incorporate in in uh, throughout the plan. Um, so, you know, when, when you think of of what those requirements might be, and you think of what the definition of development might be, um, you know, in essence, that that is that you know you 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 could write a development plan on that in in its own right. Um, uh, again, uh, looking uh, in terms of climate change and uh, strategic flood risk assessment, um, as Marcus said, we, we've we've set out that in in, in our environmental reports along with the. Uh, strategic environmental assessment and, and appropriate assessment. And again, those look at uh, climate change, um, uh, looking at, um, uh, I suppose, the, particularly the strategic flood risk, um, looking at how we might manage that. Um, uh, and that has, that has identified some, some new flood zones across the city and county as well. Um, strategic environmental assessment and appropriate assessment. Uh, the, um, the SEA um, has, you know, has, has, has the, the, the climate change adaptation at its core. Um, and that's that's uh, that underpins, I suppose, the, the the what what we what we zone and where we zone it to a certain extent uh, as per the core strategy. Um, support for water city de uh, decarbonizing zone um, set in, in in policy W city twenty in chapter three, moving towards a, 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 a carbon neutrality for the city by twenty forty. Um, that's um, that's a significant uh, piece of work. Um, uh, but again, we're supporting that. Um, there'll be a lot of, uh, I suppose, um, detail uh, to come on foot of that um, uh, in the coming months and, and indeed the coming years. Um, uh, housing targets and settlement strategy, um, looking at, uh, again, you know, looking at going back to the location layout and design of development, um, looking at uh, where, where we build, what we build and how we connect, uh, how we connect people um, to their, from their homes to their, all their, their, um, their daily needs, I suppose, their daily visits, um, and trying to uh, facilitate um, uh, as much as possible that um, that is done by sustainable modes, either public transport or or sustainable active modes. Um, looking at a tiered approach to zoning, um, our development management standards. Just looking at at um, uh, I suppose that tiered approach looks at uh, where where we may zone um, residentially zone lands. Um, the serviceability of those and looking at, uh, at the sort of the, the sequential approach um, with, a, with a town centre or city centre focus, um, or sorry, a town centre, city centre um, uh, first approach, I suppose. Uh, um, looking at our climate resilient housing um, in section 77, um, in, in term, particularly in terms of, of energy demand, uh, energy usage, um, I suppose, sustainable urban drainage systems, um, those sorts of ideas. Uh, sorry, I missed uh, waste management there in the circular economy. How we, how we reduce waste uh, is a very big um, uh, issue, I suppose, in terms of, of uh, uh, tackling uh, climate change. So we, we have, we've set out uh, policies in relation to that. Um, the, uh, the Water City and County Council uh, Climate Adaptation Strategy 
um, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in terms of um, the objectives and the aims there in relation to the built and natural environment. Um, and, the, and indeed, of course, uh, having due regard to, to um, our, our obligations uh, under the National Climate Ad Action Plan 2019 and, and the, the imminent reviews of those. Um, looking at blue-green infrastructure, um, uh, uh, particularly in Section 10.3 and, and Section 6.3, um, again, looking at SUDs, amenity spaces, and uh, how we how we might um, uh, use that that sort of softer infrastructure to to mitigate and and to adapt to, to climate change. Um, and finally, I suppose the the UN Agenda um, uh, 2030, our, our Sustainable Development Goals. I, I've mentioned these on some of the other presentations as well. But again, it's important to to note that they're you know they do have a function in terms of. Uh, our own derived um, uh, versions of those, and we have eight of them in section 16 of the plan. Um, so in particular, I suppose, uh, development that is compact, diverse, sustainable, resilient, and adaptive to climate change, that's that's something that underpins our, our as, as I've said already, um, uh, providing infrastructure and services in, a, in an environmentally sustainable way, which is planned and infrastructure led, um, and ensures that uh, sustainable management of water, waste, and other environmental resources and supports economic development, human well-being and biodiversity gain, uh, protect, conserve and enhance natural heritage, landscapes and seascapes, um, uh, makes places more sustainable, inclusive, diverse and safe. Um, in terms of uh, utilities and infrastructure, Chapter 6 deals with those, um, along with some uh, other issues, but um, I suppose just particularly for tonight's topics, um, the strategic objectives there for that. Um, really seek uh, our, 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 our uh, I suppose, provide a foundation for our policies again, um, uh, looking to uh, enable development in line with the capacity and provision of supporting infrastructure um, and utilities and to require the provision of infrastructure uh, needed for the sustainable development of lands consistent with the principle of infrastructure led development. Um, and that, that that's principle is, is one of those. Um, uh, it's, it's a, you know, along with sort of compact concentric growth, um, uh, uh, infrastructure-led development, you know, the um, the transport-oriented development. They're all they're all elements that have have followed through from the national planning framework uh, through the regional spatial economic strategy. And you know, as Liam said, we we need to give them some effect at a local level um, to promote and facilitate the provision of energy efficient, uh, low carbon infrastructure uh, and utilities and support infrastructure while supporting industry to innovate, decarbonize, and uh, 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 sorry, innovate, decarbonizing the energy sector in order to contribute to the national target of no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. Uh, again, no mean, no mean, uh, no easy task. I think that, um, uh, I think our policies, uh, 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 that, that, sorry, that, that objective underpins our policies. Um, uh, the key policy focus, uh, again, is on, on the following, so I'm not going into, in, into great detail on any of them, but again, if you, as I said, with any of the other sections, if you want to delve into them, um, uh, please do. Um, uh, support and facilitate new development that is infrastructure-led and adopts an ecosystem services on a climate-resilient approach to utility service provision. So in particular, I suppose, one of the examples that we would have in, included in, in the uh, in the utilities section um, uh, and the infrastructure section would be the possible use of, of uh, integrated constructed wetlands for servicing settlements in, in some instances um, and indeed uh, for, for sorry in servicing the settlements in terms of their wastewater and also um, uh, uh, I suppose storm water um, and looking at again how how our, our, our green and blue infrastructure may may, may be developed into a network, so um, it's it's more usable in the longer term. Uh, integrated catchment management uh, approach to water services in collaboration with Irish Water, so not just looking at at uh, at a point source or a, a local uh, a local issue, but having due regard to the impact of 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 that um, uh, proposal or that sort of development or or that need uh, infrastructure need in terms of the the, the broader uh, uh, river catchment areas. Um, Water conservation measures, um, application of standard, uh, or sorry, the application of, of, of the standard EPA code of practice for individual wastewater treatment plants, um, priority preference for wastewater, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, in terms of upgrading to existing treatment plants uh, and networks, um, new resilient low tech solutions for treatment such as ICW or integrated construction and small cluster developments for uh, of individual service sites. So looking at the, how we might uh, adapt um, different forms of infrastructure to facilitate those. 
Um, collaboration with Irish Water for Protection of Drinking Water Sources. Um, again, uh, uh, our requirements under the Water Framework Directive coming through. Um, management of surface and stormwater uh, through runoff reduction measures and suds. Again, something very important to, uh, I suppose, a lot of our smaller settlements and indeed some of our larger ones have, have um, quite old infrastructure um, and a lot of uh, a lot of combined sewers. So the the the, the means of are, are the the objective and the policy to to remove surface water at source um, from entering uh, a combined sewers. Uh, I think is is one that we have have tried to uh, in capture and uh, put forward uh, as part of the plan. Um, uh, looking at the strategic flood assessment, so uh, avoidance, re reduction, adaptation, along with effective flood plain function, um, and, and how that works with climate change as well. Um, renewable energy strategy um, uh, to be carried out during the life of the development plan. Um, not just, uh, maybe not even just a renewable energy strategy, maybe an energy strategy master plan overall. Um, I think it's it's important that we 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 start looking at at where we get our energy from and the demands that that are on that energy um, and how we move that 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 sort of that that energy around between uh, uh, the point of of uh, generation and and the end user um, and balance balance the needs I suppose across the county. Um, uh, support for energy conservation and, and renewables, so implementation of the Climate Action Plan, promote use of renewables across all sectors, including microgeneration and anaerobic digestion, uh, facilitate renewable energy proposals where appropriate, um, uh, uh, having due regard to, I suppose, uh, human health uh, and other uh, requirements set out in, in the relevant guidelines, as, as Lee mentioned before, the, the Section 28 Ministerial Guidelines deal a lot with that. Um, uh, waste management, uh, again, looking at waste minimization, recovery, disposals, um, civic community facilities, uh, project construction, and demolition, waste management. Um, so, uh, you know, so, uh, some of those, as you can see, do do sort of transcend um, uh, some other uh, some of the other sections um, in terms of that waste management, in terms of climate change and in terms of infrastructure. Um, in terms of just regeneration, briefly, um, uh, some strategic objectives we've included um, in those chapters uh, to make places more sustainable, inclusive, diverse, accessible and safe with the highest standards of design um, uh, to promote attractive, livable, well permeable, accessible, uh, permeable and accessible high quality urban spaces. Again, uh, places for people to live um, to support the role of rural areas and communities in maintaining and growing resilient population bases uh, to, uh, town, within their towns and villages and their settlement nodes uh, and the regeneration and the placemaking that, that sort of falls from that. Um, to promote a diverse choice of places which are attractive, high quality, um, uh, centered on human scale and accessible to all. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of core, I think, to, to re our regeneration requirements and our placemaking as well. Um, uh, and that, uh, I suppose, is to be achieved by uh, strengthening sustainable connections between people and their place, um, promoting uh, exemplar urban design, uh, diversity of built form uses and outdoor spaces, uh, resulting in positive social interactions, uh, reduce carbon emissions and greater opportunities for biodiversity. So uh, regeneration, again, transcends a lot of a lot of different areas. Uh, but again, a key policy focus. Um, uh, again, on our core strategy policies to support regeneration, that's at the heart of it. Um, um, uh, consolidation and compact growth, um, having due regard to uh, national planning framework, uh, the uh, NPO national plan. Po uh, sorry, the, the national policy objective uh, three, uh, which requires um, that 50% of all new homes to be located within existing footprints of the city. Um, uh, and again, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, you know, looking at at the city and town centre first approach. Um, adopting that that ten minute neighbourhood concept, um, maybe not ten minutes in all instances, but maybe fifteen minutes, um, depending. Um, but I think it's the concept is is what needs to be put forward. Um, uh, in some instances, you know, we can we can get five minute neighbourhoods, we can get ten minute neighbourhoods, we can get fifteen minute neighbourhoods. I, I think the objective is that we strive to reduce the the amount of of time that people need to travel between um, uh, their their home and where they need to go on a daily basis, and and support that movement. Um, by by means of permeability and uh, uh, and regeneration plays a big part in that. Um, undertaking active land management um, uh, and uh, having due regard to the role of the land development agency, um, and that really I suppose looks at um, you know the the I suppose the next point covers some of it in terms of uh, our our uh, legislative uh, functions uh, and our our. Um, 
powers under uh, as a local authority under the Derlick Sites Act 1990 and the Urban Regeneration and Housing Act 2015 to 18. So um, looking proactively at how we might uh, engage with with um, the local, the land development agency in relation to publicly owned land and indeed landowners um, need a, a collaborative approach to, to maybe moving things, uh, moving regeneration programs and projects on a little bit sooner than what they would if we if we weren't, um, I suppose, actively involved in that land management piece. Um, giving effect to RPO 34 in terms of, uh, uh, again, from the, the um, regional spatial and economic strategy, um, uh, particularly in terms of brownfield and infield development. Um, enhancing vibrancy and vitality in all our town centres are uh, very important um, and regeneration, uh, I suppose, is an important element in that, um, uh, I suppose, along with uh, public realm works. Um, uh, the support for uh, adaptive and flexible reuse of buildings, um, measures to reduce vacancy and targeted uh, support for transformational town regeneration programs and projects, uh, including heritage and cultural -led regeneration. Um, so, for instance, uh, I suppose the heritage led regeneration um, in, in our towns, in our smaller town centres is important. Um, uh, uh, if you look at the Viking Triangle, I suppose, is, is, is probably the, the, the big one that jumps to mind and, and uh, the, the uh, potential for you know, replicating that across our other towns. Um, uh, uh, looking at the, the urban uh, renewal development fund and the, uh, the regional uh, regeneration development fund. Um, uh, again, uh, one of, you know, uh, looking at our, our that, that cultural led regeneration through the cultural quarter in Water City, another, an, another idea. Um, and again, um, you know, these are all, these, these are all concepts that have, have grown over time. So um, it's important to, to get the ball rolling on these. Um, uh, recognition of him, uh, the of important role of regeneration in placemaking with regards also to waste reduction, um, uh, support implementation of the new homes and small towns and villages program, which is something that the regional uh, uh, assembly is working on, um, and it's something that we would be uh, again a little bit uh, like active land management in 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 looking at at vacant uh, or underutilized properties in our smaller towns and how we might get those back into uh, active uses by local communities and, and local residents. Um, regeneration of uh, strategic employment locations, particularly, I suppose, just ones I mentioned, uh, uh, again, in Waterford City, um, the, the sort of the, the, the former Waterford Crystal, the, the former Brook site and the former Gasbrook site, Miller's Marsh, just to mention a few. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose that the, the complete list of those, I suppose, um, they're outside of the industrial um, sort of maybe regeneration potential and some of those, um, you know, there are, we have a, a significant, uh, we've, well, we've identified 19 sites um, in Table 3, one of, of um, Chapter 3. Um, which, which you know, has has an indicative sort of potential to to maybe provide nineteen hundred homes. Um, now, when they can be provided um, uh, uh, in terms of of the timeline for the plan is is unknown. Um, I suppose we we have uh, included just some issues of note in terms of maybe um, constraints to development. Um, but uh, I, I think it's important that we we continue to progress with these sort of regeneration. Um, strategies that we, we and we, we, we get engaged uh, uh, with active land management and try and bring these forward to, to fruition um, and start developing uh, uh, our town centres and our city centres. Um, so again, we, we haven't, uh, I suppose, haven't, we haven't had the opportunity to look in, in, in greater detail at, at the, our larger or our other urban settlements, such, but particularly Dungarvan and Tremor, but I think the, the I suggested earlier, our, our local area plans will will give us an opportunity to look at, at a little bit more granular level in terms of, of the regeneration capacity in some of those settlements. Um, so that's that's it. Um, I'll I'll stop sharing and uh, maybe just hand back to Vanessa and uh, if, if we want to crack off with some um, questions and answers. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Hugh, for that and for um, all the speakers. There's certainly um, some massive topics there and some questions have already been coming in. Um, so there's a lot of questions in, so we'll hope that to get to as much of them, they'll certainly kick off very interesting discussion between now and half eight and the covering transport and renewable energy, uh, for example. So our first question there uh, that we'll just come to is from uh, Rita. Um, and it's asking about the current balance of funding uh, for new road infrastructure versus public transport and the extent um, of funding considerations for maintenance on roads. And I know, Fergus, you came in there with a response as well. Would any of the team just like to pick up and comment on, on that question? 
or Rita, would you like to come in first? Uh, I think I'm OK with the I'd be interested uh, to hear any more response, but I, I think as regards percentages, if you like, uh, approximately, but uh, otherwise I feel it was well answered. Great, Thanks. super yeah. Rita. Thanks. I suppose Vanessa Fergus here, if you don't mind, just to put I suppose a bit more flesh in that. Um, if you take, say, the active travel investment this year into the city and county is in the region of about between 14 and 15 million euro in terms of central government grant funding, which isn't quite the same as we get, say, in terms of support for ordinary road maintenance, but it's a hell of a lot more than it would have been a few years ago. It's probably at maybe a 60-40 a ratio at the moment between traditional areas and the newer active travel, uh, the new active travel grants. And that is more, as I said, is more likely to reach equilibrium over the next couple of years and probably in time exceeded, I, I think, based on the current government policy. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Fergus. Thanks, Rita, for that. Um, Alan, would you like to come in there on your question just regarding um, the community powered production, uh, power production with photovoltaic farms? You also had a response on that, if any of the team would like to, to come in on, on that question. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, you see what's, well, I don't know, I see what's happening in Germany and over the last many years, they've insisted on photovoltaic cells being put on new bills on existing roofs. Um, and I'm not sure about methane digesters, what they're doing there. And you mentioned them in his presentation there. Um, uh, but obviously wastewater is a huge problem for all of us and uh, including for water in the city and county county um but the, so these things but these things are available um and they have they are being used uh, in various places but germany seems to be the best example for the photovoltaic uh, for the usage of photovoltaic cells for the production of electricity and as some reports have said that it's going very well, mostly from the German government, and other reports have been very critical and said, no, they're still importing huge amounts of gas from Russia and uh, Poland. Um, so I'm just wondering, has uh, Waterford City and County Council been able to talk to any of their local authority colleagues in Germany in relation to how this is actually working? And uh, taking into account also, of course, those county councils or local authorities might want to say it's working very well as well. But are there any reports that uh, Water City and County Council can go to, you know, scientific reports that would actually give the true figures on this? Uh, I mean, if the gov German government reports are to be believed, it's very, very successful. And it would seem that any future planning permissions and also somebody mentioned there wind turbines been putting beside an industrial development, it would seem that these sorts of things are very direct. Um, and if it works in Germany, could we apply the same here? Thanks, Alan. Anybody from the team like to come in on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's it's something that that's probably well outside the remit of, of um, the, the development plan, I think, unfortunately, I think, you know, uh, uh, my own view, I think, is that um, uh, I suppose if, if 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 the tariffs are right, people would um, would would get engaged um, and it, uh, that would bring the, the technology on a little. Um, so there's probably a little bit of catch up there that needs to be done, maybe at a national level, I'm not sure. Um, but I suppose in terms of, of the day to day uh, functionings of, of the local authority and what the development plan can do, you know, we, we would support any of those. Um, I think um, uh, you know uh, 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 within our own action uh, adaptation plan, um, we you know we, we are looking at at, at uh, um, our own public buildings and how we might uh, achieve um, you know reduce carbon uh, 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 in terms of the 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 annual sort of energy budgets around those. So I think we can do our bit, um, but I think there's there's you know we have to we have to keep in mind that the the, the plan can only facilitate what what in, in certain instances and particularly in in terms of this. What, what a market might might actually throw at us, if, if you know what I mean. I do, I do. I just wonder, um, if, since they are mentioned in the plan and you did mention them in, in your um, presentation there, just uh, is it worthwhile the uh, Water City and County Council uh, just talking to the, the Germans or whoever, the experts in this, just in relation to informing the plan so that uh, the plan going forward is based on something on the on the reality of the German experience to use that example again, 
uh, rather than putting it in as, I, I mean, it's going in as a vision, but is it a vision based on something that we, we know works elsewhere? Um, true, yeah, but I, I suppose, again, it's back to, uh, we, we're sort of, to a certain extent, the plan is going to be reactionary in terms of anything like that. You know, we, we can, we, as I said, um, and as the policies say, we, we support it um, if, if it comes our way. Um, but again, we don't, we don't have control over bringing it our way. Mm, um, sure. um, and that's the unfortunate piece. But I think, you know, we do have control, as I said, over some of our own properties and we'd be, we'd be progressing ahead with that. But um, uh, I, I just I just feel that we're we're a little bit um, in we're not in the driving seat for this, if you know what I mean. Yeah. At the same time, you should think of, you say, planning guidelines in Waterford County in relation to, for instance, the colour put on the outside of, of buildings in the rural landscape and things like that. And um, so, so there, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how the Germans did it. Did they put it in as a guideline or did they put it in as a requirement in a planning application that you must put, say, for instance, photovoltaic cells on the roof of whatever you built? And is that something that a local authority can do here? Well, I, I suppose that's a good point because I, I know back in back in the day, as we say, um, I, I, I can't remember which development plan it was, but the, the city the city development plan had an objective for for building energy audits um, uh, before um, the building regulations took over in terms of building energy. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of the development plan, we, it, again, I, I suppose it falls to our function in terms of the planning act. Uh, we don't have any, we don't have any function in, uh, or, you know, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, I suppose, have the, the authority to put a, a policy or to put a, a condition on, on a, 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 you know, a grant of planning permission that you have to have a, a particular standard of, of energy rating. That's that's driven by uh, building control. Um, okay. so we're uh, we're a little bit, as I said, we're not exactly in the driving seat in this. But um, and and it, but it's it is a good point because we we don't have um, we have we have uh, you know some amendments to our um, our wind energy guidelines, but we we have yet to we have we have yet to get um, a, a, a solar energy guidelines from the department. So um, again, you know that might be the first step. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks Great. for that, Alan. And Hugh, we may come back to that topic again shortly because there's another question in here um, from Ashling O'Connell. Ashling, would you like to come in there just in terms of um, your question on wind farms? Hi, um, I was just saying about the wind farms, like a lot of them in, like I'm from Dungarvan and a lot of them are being rejected by residents, you know, because they're unsightly, they create noise. So what um, the other, what Alan had said about offshore wind farms, I think that would be very valuable um, to look at. So he mentioned about the German um, approach to it and also in the Netherlands, like are they looking into that? And like, especially the one in GSK, like that produces a lot of pollution is on the edge of the town and like a big wind turbine there that would have generated 20% of their electricity and power for the plant got rejected because the residents were like having the rights to object, which is fair enough. But like, where do we stand with renewable energy for the county moving forward? Thanks, Ashling. Yeah, I think I'm in that, Vanessa. I suppose uh, offshore wind energy is not something that we have any direct input uh, as of now. Um, as a planning authority, we're only, um, yeah. we're only controlling development um, onshore. Um, now, there is a new um, National Marine Planning Framework in place, uh, which was just recently published uh, following around a public consultation, and I suppose that's going to be delivered and rolled out over the next number of years, and um, it's envisaged that a little bit like the hierarchy of um, land use plans for the terrestrial authorities, that there would be a national plan and below that there would be regional or area plans for different areas along our coastline and then there would be more site specific plans for estuaries and particular locations like that so we will get involved in that we will be asked to input into that process and I think you know that's where we can have a conversation with uh, the department uh, the, the, the various departments there's more than one department involved here uh, in relation to these sorts of projects which would be happening um, 
out at sea offshore. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any direct involvement. Um, we can consult with the departments, uh, with the licensing and with the permitting agencies, but um, hopefully through the development of detailed policy around this area, we will have more of an input into the future. Thanks, Liam. Is that okay, Ashling? Do you want yeah. to come back in on that? No, he's answered my question. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And um, we'll just pop back to a transport question here from James O'Donoghue. James, would you like to come in there? And um, just with regard to timelines around that county transport plan, I know there's a couple of questions in on, on timelines and so on and the processes that fall out or that maybe govern nationally um, around the plan. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I suppose I'm just interested because, um, well, first of all, I represent local link here. So um, a lot of the, the development, I think, in local public transport over the next few years will be governed by Connecting Ireland uh, when the NTA get to rolling that out over the next uh, number of years. Um, but in the meantime, we in local link are developing, you know, local, our local public transport services. I'm, I'm in the middle now of submitting something like 15 applications for funding for various services. Uh, but we do, we do all that in the absence of a county transport plan. So that's why I was interested to see what might be the thinking in terms of a timeline on, on producing one of those. It would be very handy for us to have a, an, an actual transport, county transport plan to fall back on in terms of making submissions to the NTA. Thanks, James. Thank you, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not entirely. Uh, I don't know to give you not not to give you a short answer. Um, but I think it's it's. Uh, I I think as as Fergus suggested, you know, there there's a move away in terms of the funding streams from from the the conventional to the to the to the more active mode um, and to the more uh, sustainable public transport mode. So I think. Um, I think we we do need to maybe move on that as as soon as we we have our our W maths together um, uh, because we do need to look we need we need to look at at um, you know we, 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 I suppose we have to look at at uh, the development plan I suppose over its lifetime is going to be monitored um, and we we will have to look at uh, the the I suppose the change in. Uh, and hopefully the reduction in in, in uh, carbon um, produced by um, by private transport modes. So um, I think there's there's a strategy that we need to put in place for that sooner rather than later. But um, we haven't we haven't gotten into any detail on that yet. Maybe Fergus might have a little bit more uh, information on it. Um, but we we will certainly be starting, I suppose, uh, in terms of of uh, looking at local transport plans as part of our local area plan um, uh, rollout. Um, but there are, yeah, I, I take your point, there are the, the county strategy that we need to look at too. No, Hugh, I'll just come in on that. I mean, we certainly will be developing active travel plans for the city, uh, Dungarvan and Tor over the next year or so. And we'd hope to start public consultation on some of those by later on this year, early into, into next year. And I suppose at a lower level, we'll be doing a certain amount of planning for the, the smaller towns and villages, but it's like the overall, I suppose transport plan, particularly with respect to public transport, will be guided by the NTA Bus Connects uh, project. And I suppose we'd see us uh, supporting the, the aims of that and supporting the outcomes of that. Thanks, Fergus. Is that okay, Jane? Sorry, do you want to come back in? No, that's fine. I, as I said, I, I mean, I, you know, we'd be aware that the, the as I say, Connecting Ireland will, will over, overarch all of this anyway. But I mean, um, anytime we try to, anytime we submit, make a submission to the DNTA, they all, they're always looking for evidence base uh, data, you know, to back us up. Um, like, for instance, for, we, we've, we've been looking for a service to link Dungarvan to Clonmel, which doesn't exist at the moment. No public transport service between the two towns. We've been looking for that for five years, and we all we get back from the NTA is you know looking for evidence that's why i say if we, if we had some some local plans to fall back on it would be we would really you know what's our case but um yeah we'll see where we go from here i suppose okay thanks james yes. um just staying on the transport question rita would you like to come in there with regard to your questions around the electric bike scheme and also e-scooters it'd be quite topical at the moment um i suppose nationally um, yeah, it was just particularly around the e-scooters. I think I got a reply um, in relation to the bike scheme, uh, but it was just the e-scooters because there's been a fair bit of controversy. And, you know, when you have pedestrians, you have cyclists, 
and you've narrow streets and you didn't put in e-scooters and roller skates and you know what I mean? You've older people and you've, you know, groups of, you know, school children and things can get kind of particularly the scooters, I think, can and genuinely are quite hazardous. There have been uh, quite a number of serious accidents and um, just even the roads as well, you know, um, certainly coming into the city, um, you know, I just think there's a bit of a safety issue there and how much thought has been given to that or can managing them having special routes or something, I, I don't really know. Grace, th thanks, Rita. Yeah. Uh, Venezuela come in on that one. Um, E-scooters will be subject, like there's, there's legislation being drafted at a national level at the moment, Rita, to, that will regulate the use and standards, etc., for e-scooters in the country. And uh, there may very well be local bylaws that will come out of that in terms of restricting their use as e -cells for. I certainly know from that the at national level, like at the moment, there is no regulation. They, but they are effectively illegal for use on the streets of Pat at the moment. Uh, they've certainly, the new regulate the new uh, legislation will certainly have speed restrictions on them. And the we've been talking to a number of potential hire operators as well in the past number of months, and uh, they will be very conscious of, the, of this, having learned from it were in hard learned experience elsewhere. And they, they, this new technology available at the moment where they can automatically limit uh, geographically. Uh, limit the speed of e-scooters, say, in shared surface areas or in footpaths or elsewhere. So that, say, for instance, an e-scooter might have a top speed of 20 kph, but if it, if it enters onto a footpath or into a shared surface area, it, the maximum speed might drop to 5 or 50 kph, which could be around walking speed. So I think in the technology, I think, will, it, will address those concerns. Okay, thanks very uh, And, like, will there be monitoring? Because I think it could really put older people off, you know, using I just think if it becomes really popular you know that um will there be monitoring kind of on the street um people keep uh, an eye on things or I suppose looking for feedback through yeah, yeah. I, I, as I said like certainly with the higher models we've been looking at they will automatically restrict speed on scooters down to a walking pace more like, so something very similar to a walking pace when we're in at pedestrian zones and that but there, it, it's also probably even though we haven't seen sight of the legislation as of yet that the e-scooters, that the use of e-scooters e may be restricted to either cycle lanes and uh, public roads and not in footpaths. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Like yeah, it's a bit like everything else. I mean, if somebody breaks the law, they, 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 it's the guard you will enforce <laughs> if, if somebody's using uh, a device, be it a, an e-bike as the e-scooter or otherwise inappropriately or, or, or in the wrong place. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Rita, and thanks, Fergus. Um, James, you have a question there just with regard to that, um, I suppose, which takes precedence um, with regard to transport to the NTA um, over council plans. Would you like to come in on, on that question? Yeah. <coughs> Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, it would be quite, quite obvious that um, the plans that are required for the city in relation to transport, both in the metropolitan area and the surroundings um, may not favour the plans of the NTA um, or the other government bodies that provide the finance. Um, how can the council overcome this and how can it be inscribed into the development plan of the needs that are needed rather than the needs that are going to be given? Thanks, James. Liam? I suppose we've got a very good working relationship with the NTA and uh, I don't see any conflict as, as things stand between, you know, their uh, vision and their aspirations for the city and county versus ours. Um, certainly we have to work with these agencies because, you know, they have access to the funding at central government level that we need to implement uh, these solutions and these changes. Um, but we find that, that our interactions to date with the NTA have always been very, very positive. Um, yeah, as I said, there's no difficulty, there's no conflict uh, as things currently stand. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Vanessa, just um, uh, the, the NTE, uh, just that, that process itself will have its own public consultation element as well, um, uh, James. So um, uh, again, I'm not sure what the dates are around that, but I, I, I think they're talking about like four, approximately four weeks public consultation towards the 
the latter end of, of this year. So um, it will be worthwhile maybe just seeing what's in that and, you know, you, you'll be able to um, raise any concerns in relation to that uh, as well. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll be trying to um, dovetail the, um, the the chief executive's report um, to the members, which will be issued um, uh, to the council in, in uh, November. And we'll be trying to align, I suppose, the, the NTA, the WMATs and, and other issues um, with, with our policy. So um, it'll, be, it'll be, you know, there are opportunities there yet to, to just see what's going to come um, and to see what, what influence we can have on it. Thanks for that, Hugh. Thanks, James. Um, there's a, a question there regarding mapping. Um, Karen, would you like to come in on that in terms of uh, making submission and sort of maps that are available in terms of existing services and infrastructure? Um, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I think uh, Liam has already answered that. He's going to uh, see if he can talk to the GIS section of the council to see how they might make mapping of existing infrastructure available to the public as part of the development process. Thanks, Karen. Um, so there are story maps, Liam, do you just want to maybe um, clarify where those maps may be available if, if they are, if they do come online? Yeah, well, I just, I can't give any commitment as of now. I need to talk to our GIS section because there may be some issues around the sharing of data, which in some instances, you know, we'd have to talk to third parties, third party agencies about, uh, but certainly anything that we have that we can share, um, we will make that available. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where yet, but we'll certain we'll put it up if we're put, if we're uploading any new maps to the system, uh, we'll put a notice um, at the welcome page just to direct people to those maps as soon as we have them and as soon as we can put them up there. That's great. Thanks for the clarification, Liam, um, on that mapping question. Uh, a few more questions uh, in there now. We'll just come back to Rita. Rita, you have another question in there regarding um, using natural habitat creation adaptable land use. Um, would you like to come in on that, for example, making space for increased floodplains and, and so on? Um, just how it could complement SUDS, I guess, and, you know, harder engineering um, uh, floods. Uh, prevention, whatever, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a bit of a win-win. It's a win-win for nature um, and it's, you know, for infrastructure flood control uh, because that will have obviously impacts on inf other infrastructure and uh, buildings and everything. So just whether that's being integrated, I suppose. Thanks, Rita. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, uh, and apologies, um, um, your question was only sort of made me think of, of um, one of the slides that uh, you, you, some of the people, I suppose, that were on the call last night, maybe um, might recall the um, the green infrastructure sort of uh, plan or, or well, the, the requirement, I suppose, and the proposal from our, uh, from the, the council to, to put together a, a, a blue green infrastructure strategy for Waterford City um, in the first instance anyway. Um, so we're, we're sort of working on that and it's all, I suppose you're, you're right Rita, it's all about networks and how things can be interlinked um, and how we can, how we can get, I suppose, value added from, from uh, a, a water swale or from a, a, an integrated constructed wetland, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I suppose, you know, even within our own projects, um, I suppose we're, you know, our, our urban uh, renewal projects down around O'Connell Street um, and, in, you know, the remaining public realm works that are uh, that are outstanding I suppose are areas that are outstanding in the city um, that will be subject to works over the coming years um, you know we are we are looking at trying to incorporate um, you know uh, rain gardens and uh, um, sort of uh, uh, additional tree planting and additional that biodiversity gain that you're talking about um, but unfortunately there's no one there's no one um, sort of uh, solution fits all but um, I think and you know we, we are sort of doing it um, uh, in terms of uh, the wastewater and the surface water management in Mount Congreve, that's uh, the project that we're undertaking out there at the minute. So I, I suppose we are conscious that it is uh, that it is uh, um, something that we, we, we need to have regard to. We, we put it out there in the plan, I think, uh, in terms of the utilities and uh, the biodiversity and the climate change policies in general. Um, and, you know, we will be we will be requiring development to, to, to get on board with that. Um, you know, that, as I said, the source reduction of water that 
um, you know, if, if, if reduce its source and, and attenuate um, above ground rather than in some, you know, some pit that you've constructed and covered over with grass. Um, just to, you know, to try and look at that biodiversity again, and, and we certainly be, be, be fully supportive of that, I think, and, and I think the policies reflect that. I, I hope to do if they don't um certainly um you know uh, as i said uh, uh, and as we're saying uh, through all these um uh, webinars um you know come back to us if you have a, a an idea of how we might better achieve it yeah the just the last thing was the the bride project is really interesting farming project uh i think it's donald scahan was the name of the guy and just from a regional point of view and connecting the bride and the black water through there seems to be a lot of potential for tourism amenity linking everything in together you know you could have the the greenway you link blackwater um you know there's different historical houses uh, along one section of the blackwater um john scan is doing his project over uh you know at the bride and just seems there's great potential for linking things really linking that into waterford and similar projects you know where you could incorporate the you know uh, expansion areas when you need them kind of as part of farming really and yeah anyway that's it yeah thanks yeah um no i appreciate that but uh, again i just i just say it and and it's a little bit like we're not in the driving seat when it comes to farming uh, a lot of the time you know we have we have um you know our development function has has some uh uh i suppose say or some control if you want to use that word uh, in terms of of what happens on on some agricultural lands, but an awful lot of what happens on agricultural lands and indeed in forestry, um, is is um isn't isn't uh, I suppose provided for in in the planning uh, regulations or the planning acts. So you know to lift we we have we have and it's something it's something we, we we're conscious of I suppose in terms of the water framework directive in particular and you know trying to retain and uh, maintain water quality. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't have control over where some farmer wants to decide to spread his slurry um, and when he wants to spread it and how much he wants to spread. Do you know, so it's kind of, you know, we, we are, we're just not in the driving seat, I think, in, in all issues. But I think we've, we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, I suppose, take, take the best step forward in terms of where we can affect some change and affect some positive um, move towards biodiversity gain. And who, who controls who controls that view? Who controls the slurry spreading and monitors that? And uh, thanks for that question, Alan. And if you hold that, and maybe you okay. can take two questions, uh, because Dave has his hand up as well. So, Dave, you're coming in on this question also. So you just have two questions there, Hugh. Sorry, Dave, over to you. You just have to unmute, Dave. Yeah, no, no, fire away. My question was um, uh, to do with the local area plan. So if you want to finish up right. there. With, yeah, yeah. Perfect. We'll come to you in a moment then, Dave. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, Alan. So just on Alan's question, Hugh. Um, in terms of land splitting, I, I imagine it's it's through the um, it's through the various environmental schemes that planners uh, get engaged with. or Sorry, that farmers get engaged with. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, 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 as I can recall um, it's a while since I've done any work around it, um, but um, uh, it's it's you know it's all the 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 uh, the gloss programs and all the the current uh, iterations of that 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 farmers you know sign up to and, and there are various conditions and limitations around that and and I think that you know that that sort of dictates um, you know uh, uh, what happens on the with in relation to nitrates and everything else. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Just before we move on to um, to Dave's question, um, just to clarify, if submissions were made to the first stage of the consultation, detailed submissions, um, that submission needs to be put in again. Is that right at this stage, or or does? It? Yep. So if you just yeah, want to clarify it, that, Hugh, exactly um, the process with the submissions and the statutory yeah, well, process around that. Yeah, as Marcus as Marcus said earlier, you know, um, uh, I suppose the portal is there for. For the purpose of of allowing people to to I suppose register engage or, sorry firstly engage with the documentation um and uh, register and make a submission um uh, and uh, the, the 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 beauty of it I suppose is that uh, with the best in will in the world if somebody uh, writes in um a, a, a physical uh, a submission into us by post um 
uh, you know, human error is always a, a possibility that um, it that that may not find its way onto the portal um, to to our own, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an error on our behalf or on somebody's behalf that is just not registered on on somebody's uh, on the portal on, on behalf of that the person who submitted it in writing. Um, you know, we're we're saying um, you know get it in on the portal and. And that will definitely find its way onto the uh, chief chief executive's report, and it'll it will have um, it will uh, it will give us a summary, I suppose, of what the consult or the, the submission uh, has set out, and it will give a, a response and a recommendation of the chief executive to the elected members. So that's the only surefire way I think um, that that we can be one hundred percent positive that the, you know all the submissions are received uh, are find their way to that uh, chief executive's report. Perfect. So even if a submission went in at the first stage, it's very important that it it, it goes in again because it's a new consideration of submissions. Yeah, it's a new, it's a new. In effect, it's a new portal and it's a new process. So um, yeah. the, the thing starts again, unfortunately. But uh, again, I suppose if if submission was made previously, um, again it's there uh, and we can have another look at it. Thanks, you. And um, Dave. Uh, sorry for the delay there. Would you like to come in with your question? Yeah, I'm conscious no. we're, we're nearly at half eight, so... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, make, I'll make it left. quick. <laughs> Not at all. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, no, just I suppose uh, tonight was very informative because it gives us more of an understanding with the actual process. But I suppose my questions then are just trying to break that down slightly further in terms of the local area plans. So a couple of questions around that, um, and I suppose to use Liam's terminology there, uh, what's the hierarchy within that? So how important is a local area plan to the overall county plan uh, being one question? Um, secondly, how many local areas are there going to be within that plan? And um, I suppose the last question is like, who implements that in terms of, I understand we have a merged uh, county and CC now, but I suppose uh, just to find out a little bit more detail and who specifically would implement the the local area plans, like what what locals will be involved in that, basically, please. Um, uh, yeah, um, just uh, um, in terms of just the last uh, part of that question, um, I suppose the uh, the hierarchy, as Liam said, is you know our development plans. Of the national and regional uh, planning documents, um, local area plans, uh, I suppose, then have their own statutory process, um, and uh, you know that that will require publication of a notice and uh, additional public consultation, um, chief executive reports, all the strategic environmental reports, and the other environmental reports will all have to be done. Um, they are more local um, uh, by name, I suppose, and the intention, I suppose, is that. Certainly, we will be doing them for our urban. Uh, I suppose that yeah, there there are mandatory ones, and then there are ones that we can we can do. Um, but uh, again, they're they're dealing with urban areas, so they're that that's areas with a population over fifteen hundred people. Um, so we you know we 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 will be mandatory obliged to do them for Tremor and Dungarvan, um, okay. for parts of Waterford City. And I imagine you know if there is a timeline around these, we will be pushing ahead with those first. Um, okay. We will be doing them uh, as well for um, uh, the intention anyway, certainly is to do them for Dummer uh, and Portlaw and Lismore, the, the last two have, have local area plans already. Um, uh, and as Liam said earlier, I, I think it's important to recognise the, 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 the significance of the, the Gwail Tachtanesha and the area around Ring, Ring and, and Shannon Fubble, so uh, we will be uh, including one there as well. Um, uh, so, and I think when you look at the maps, I think, you know, you could, you could, you could sort of, um, you know, it's quite clear. I think the the any of the any of the settlements that we've zoned uh, for development in uh, will be subject to a local area plan or local area plans um, in some instances. Um, and then I suppose there are there is a smaller, I suppose, a, a lower tier of plans, but they're non-statutory. So um, we may we may um, I suppose depend on resources and how we how we how we can uh, engage. Um, uh, with local communities, we, we may look at uh, some maybe sort of village design statements or, or some sort of local unstatutory plan like that that will maybe get a community together and sort of get some idea around what they, yeah. what they envisage their, their um, settlement growing uh, by or, or what it might look like when it is uh, developed or what are the important elements that we need to protect and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, bring forward in, in any new development. Um, 
So, um, sorry, I, I don't know that I get all of the questions. No, no, no that, that's very good. Uh, thanks very much. Just uh, again, then, in terms of like, we'll say, we'll jump ahead to when the national or when our own Waterford City and County plan is actually finalised and it's, it's it's a green light and it's all signed, sealed and delivered, so to speak. Uh, just to go then in terms of the delivery of that then, like, uh, again, is it a case of the bigger items on the agenda first or how does that manifest itself like? Well, like, I think, we, you know, we, we would be obliged to 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 um, prepare local area plans for the, the larger settlements. I think under the legislation, we'd be advised to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they will be the important ones. Um, the the As I said, I think, the um, you know, on, on one of the other nights, I think, you know, the 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 language uh, the language plan for um, the Gwail Talks um, is due um, I think in around 2024 I think okay um, so we might we might uh, it might be a good idea to dovetail our local area plan in relation to to that timeline as well and, and oh, possibly yeah. then the other ones in between uh, uh, but it, there there is no no um, hard fast I suppose rule as to when we're going to do them they are oh. they are they are I suppose they are implemented by by uh, Water City and County Council. Um, um, yeah. But they are made by the the, the municipal district members. So that, that, uh, the right. yeah. yeah, no, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks for that, Dave. Cheers, um, thank you. I'm conscious we're at the end of the session. It's half past eight, but if Mike just pointed two questions, um, just acknowledging that any other questions that aren't touched on, please do email the planners. Their email is on the um, the website consult at waterfordcouncil.ie and I'm sure Liam will just give us that again in a few moments. Um, but just two maybe very quick responses to the question Alan had regarding this Waterford City County Council of Public Funding for Public Housing are enough and also Rita's question there, what about um, does the plan take account of the pandemic continuing for some years um, on infrastructure? And is there any consideration of small ferries, light rail funiculars? So maybe some very brief answers uh, before we close out on that, if there are any. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of the housing, I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not engaged in the in 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 the. Uh, I'm not involved in in the delivery of of um, uh, our housing. Uh, and the different types of uh, housing requirements that we have. Um, I suppose our housing strategy or our draft housing strategy, which is um, uh, set out in the appendices, um, I suppose looks to the future as to what what housing uh, housing types and tenures we need to be able to provide. But um, I, I'm unfortunately, I just I I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be in the position to answer whether we have enough money or not. Um, uh, and in terms of the the second question, sorry, Vanessa, just run it past me again. So Rita's question is, does the infrastructural element of the plan take into account the potential for the pandemic continuing for some years or future pandemics, given the projections and particularly negative impacts on public transport development and the need to be adaptable? Has there been consideration, um, has there been consideration of the increased use of small ferries such as in Stockholm, light rails, funiculars? Um, well, I, I suppose uh, I suppose our, our core strategy sets out our, our population targets. Um, I know I appreciate the, that COVID has has had a, a, a significant impact on on I suppose on two things. I suppose uh, the the amount that people move, um, uh, and I suppose where people uh, you know choose to reside and and to undertake their work on a basis in in, in many instances. So, um, I, I think you know I, I I would I would be suggesting that our our the infrastructure requirements um, uh, for the plan um, are, are the same, uh, irrespective. I think in terms of service infrastructure uh, on a on, on that daily basis, and particularly in terms of pipes in the ground and, and and that type of of service infrastructure. In terms of, I think in terms of the you know that 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 sort of significant public um, uh, uh, transport structure. I think we we have to wait and see what the W maths produces because. Um, you know, I, I think even for for a city this size and scale of of um, uh, Waterford, uh, you know, realistically speaking, I think you know we're, we're looking at uh, you know quality bus corridors as being probably the the main, uh, you know one of the main uh, public um, or it's probably the main uh, pub, uh, public means of transport. Um, whether the, um, and whether um, there's a, a, a viability for for commercial. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, water transport. I'm not sure, but maybe Fergus might. Uh, I'm not wanting to to uh, put the question back on, but he might have a little bit more information on it than I do. 
I wouldn't really have, have a great deal to add to that. Um, I'm not even too sure where where light ferries or small ferries would would, would transit to and from the city. It's uh, I know that there's there are elements of residential areas say that around the Dunmore Road and Ferry Bank that could potentially link across. But at the moment, we it's not I suppose in any of our thinking or in, 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 in and not in any of our planning at the moment in terms of, of uh, there being options or alternatives to public transport. I suppose we would probably see with the active travel and, and with the with a huge de uh, increased uh, budgets and the rollout of say cycling and walking infrastructure as those providing I suppose uh, potential alternatives as well in the event of another pandemic. But as, as you said a few moments ago, I mean the pandemic has changed a lot of the, 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 the way we travel. It's probably during the periods of lockdown we've all seen very significant reductions in use both of, of car transport, of public transport and, and otherwise because people adapted and had other means of methods of means of, of working, uh, working remotely, working at home or whatever. And uh, I think we, we would just have to adapt uh, as and when or if we get future future pandemics. But I think that the investment in active travel, particularly in the, the walking cycling infrastructure, I think will, will allow us to, I suppose, respond um, better in a future pandemic, which hopefully we won't see, but certainly will, will, will provide us, uh, will, will provide people with, with alternatives other than public transport, which again uh, was severely restricted during the, during the current pandemic. But again, it's that we haven't given the the, 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 the idea of, of ferries and flinkers hasn't really featured in our thinking to date. Thanks very much, um, everyone. Um, so that brings our session to a close. I hope you all found that your questions were, were answered and, and that you you got the responses that, that you, you needed or found valuable from the planning team. I'm just going to hand over to senior planner now, Liam McGree, uh, to close out. Yeah, thank you very much, Vanessa. And just thanks to everybody who participated this evening. It was a very interesting conversation. Um, hopefully, you know, it gave you an opportunity to raise issues with ourselves that, you know, we can maybe... Uh, think on and see whether or not you know there are particular changes that we need to make in our approach. Um, but I would encourage each one of you to make a submission. Uh, as you said earlier, you know only written submissions received during the process will be reported directly to the members, and will inform the decision of the members uh, in relation to what changes they might make. So I would encourage everybody to make a submission through the portal. Uh, again, the the website we've. Um, we've stated it before, but consult.waterforcouncil.ie, everything that you need will be available there, contact details, the portal through which you can make your submissions, as well as all the documentation associated with the plan. Um, this has been the third of uh, six sessions that we're having, um, public sessions um, in the month of July. Uh, we've got three more next week, uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night and Thursday night. Uh, while we were dealing with more, I suppose, thematic issues this week, we'll be dealing with more, uh, geographic areas next week. And we'll look, be looking at placemaking. So the first of those sessions on Tuesday evening at seven o'clock will deal with the Waterford metropolitan area. Uh, the second on Wednesday at seven o'clock in the evening uh, deals with the Cumra district, which is the central part of the county. And then the western part of the county, which is the Dungarvan Lismore Municipal District, uh, will be having a conversation with people around that uh, on Thursday evening at seven o'clock. So again, I'd encourage uh, any of you to dial in to connect into those meetings uh, if you want to discuss things that are you know particular to your area. And um, again, I just urge you all to make your views known, send in your submissions to us. Uh, this is a public process. Um, we rely heavily on public submissions to inform the process. And again, thank you all for participating so far.